Good morning. <clears throat> Our Sunday school lesson for today uh, comes from the book of Genesis, and it is continuing this, this ongoing theme that we've had for some time about work and, and the, the, honestly, the, the, the privilege and the responsibility of our personal work. Well, last week, my pineapple harvest took place. For three years, I waited, and a few months ago, I saw a stalk rising up from the middle of the plant, and in subsequent weeks, I saw the pineapple begin to grow from marble to golf size and finally to the size of a pint jar before it began to turn from its brown and green coloration to a dull gold and then to a bright yellow. When I sliced it open and cut off the outer casing, the slices tasted far better than those from nearby stores where they had been prematurely harvested and allowed to ripen in storage boxes before being displayed in the grocery aisles. Of course, the superior flavor may have been somewhat enhanced in my mind because this was a product of my own labor. There's just something about the fruits from the home garden that set them apart. Imagine what it would have been like for Adam as he checked out the Garden of Eden for the first time. Too often, I've struggled to understand why there is a detailed account in chapter 1 of Genesis, followed by a condensed version in chapter 2. Perhaps the ancestor to the Cliffs Notes industry had a biblical background. Well, whatever the reason, there are unique features in each chapter. It kind of makes me wonder what it, would have, what it would be like if Adam were being shown the Garden of Eden today. I have a feeling that after seeing all the fruit trees, all of the various vegetables growing in abundance, and all the beautiful blooms of the flowers, he would say, what a wonderful location this would be for a housing project. Just think of all the condos we could pack into this space. Or in the 60s, as he explored the garden while he was dressed in his tie-dyed t-shirt, ragged jeans and sandals, Adam would look to his creator and say, can you really dig it? And of course, the reply would be, well, that's exactly what I had in mind. Well, maybe for now, we need to stick to the Bible verses in today's scripture passages. Let's not get bent out of shape because they don't come through as a science manual's theories of the when, what, and how of creation. The biblical writers, taking the sacred stories passed down from ancient Hebrew, Hebrew tradition, were shaped into the narratives of Genesis 1 and 2. We need to read them in the way that we would read the parables of Jesus and allow these writers from around 400 to 1000 BC share the accounts <clears throat> to demonstrate <clears throat> God's relationship to mankind and the failure of mankind to remain steadfast in worshiping God and seeking his guidance in our lives. Genesis 1, 1 through <clears throat> 25 begins with the earth without shape dark and covered by the sea. No order, only chaos. Then God swept over the waters. The Hebrew translation <clears throat> describes Yahweh as brooding or hesitating before starting the life process into motion. Verses 3 through 19 describe the days of creation, but could be seen as different phases each depending on the previous one, increasing in intensity until living creatures and humans appear. Look at each phase. First, there is darkness, then light to be separated from the darkness, then the restraining of the sea to create dry land, followed by vegetation to stabilize the land and produce food, then celestial lights to determine time and seasons, and then the arrival of living creatures. Verses 20 through 25 
present the creation of animals, emphasizing <clears throat> the vastness, diversity, and wildness inhabiting the earth. Finally, it was time for the creation of humans. <clears throat> I'm going to, to read now verses uh, 26 through 31 of chapter 1 of Genesis. Then God said, Let us make humanity in our image to resemble us, so they may take charge of the fish of the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, all the earth, and all the crawling things on earth. God created humanity in God's own image. In the divine image, God created them, male and female. God created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fertile and multiply. Fill the earth and master it. Take charge of the fish of the sea, the birds in the sky, and everything crawling on the ground. Then God said, I now give to you all the plants on the earth that yield seeds and all the trees whose fruit produces its seeds within it. This, these will be your food. To all wildlife, to all birds in the sky, and to everything crawling on the ground, to everything that breathes, I give all the green grasses for food. And that's what happened. God saw everything he had made. It was supremely good. There was evening and there was morning the sixth day. <clears throat> Perhaps our first question about verse 26, who is us? Because it says, let us make humanity in our image. Who is us? Well, apparently God enlisted heavenly beings to assist in the process and to be available to help communicate with the human race. Then there's the, the reference to being created in God's image. How do humans resemble divinity? Perhaps it's not a mere physical resemblance, but maybe with abilities, creativity, intellect, speech, and characteristics such as compassion, or justice. Humans also had the ability to, to bring in, <clears throat> I'm sorry, it also had the ability to being in charge to keep things in a way that there could continue to be an abundance and a way to continue an enjoyment of the good earth that the humans were to supervise. Notice that in the first chapter, male and female were created at the same time. Perhaps this was an original biblical perspective of equality. Well, verses 28 through 30 seem to be both a blessing and a command. As God grants humans the earth that lies before them, fill the earth and master it the fruit, the vegetables, the birds, the fish, the animals will provide you food. It's your responsibility to ensure that there is enough for all. Now let's, let's look at the second chapter of Genesis, verses four through eight. Notice in this chapter that there will be no mention of light, dark, day, night, or formless seas and dry land. On the day the Lord God made earth and sky, before any wild plants appeared on the earth and before any field crops grew, because the Lord God hadn't yet sent rain on the earth and there was still no human being to farm the fertile land, though a stream rose from the earth and watered all of the fertile land, the Lord God formed the human from the topsoil of the fertile land and blew life's breath into his nostrils. The human came to life. The Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east and put there the human he had formed. God created earth and sky, and a stream rose up and watered the fertile land. Then he formed the human from the topsoil and blew the breath of life into his nostrils. And the human then was placed in the garden 
that God had planted in Eden. Well, a little different from that first version we read in, in chapter 1 of, of Genesis. Now let's, let's look at verses 15 through 20. The Lord God took the human and settled him in the Garden of Eden to farm it and take care of it. The Lord God commanded the human, eat your fill from all of the garden's trees, but don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, because on the day you eat from it, you will die. Then the Lord God said, it's not good that human is alone. I will make him a helper that is perfect for him. So the Lord God formed from the fertile land all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky and brought them to the human to see what he would name them. The human gave each living being its name. The human named all the livestock, all the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But a helper, perfect for him, was nowhere to be found. Well, like the creation account in chapter 1. These verses include God's address to Adam with a command as brooding or hesitating could not help him. He asked him to master the earth. But it was also specified that he was to farm and take care of the garden. God had brought creation to this point. But now it's man's responsibility to tend to the garden. Verses 16 through 17 first mention the tree of life, where there will be the temptation for man to move from tending the land to lording over it. In verse 18, we find another difference from chapter 1. There had been no creation, no separate creation of the woman to accompany the man, and the woman seem to appear simultaneously with the man. But here we find that the man is experiencing loneliness. The first thing considered not good in the Garden of Eden, not because he was incapable of working alone, but because he needed an intimate and emotional connection with another human. In the concluding verses of chapter 2, the partner for Adam was described as being created from his flesh. When his side was opened and a rib or, or a piece of flesh was taken to create his mate. She was named woman because according to Adam, she is the bone of my bone and flesh from my flesh. She was considered to be the perfect companion for the man. And now the humans would be ready to pursue their calling as servants and protectors of God's magnificent, fertile creation. When I was a boy, I had to do a lot of hoeing and weeding and picking vegetables in the garden. I also did a lot of leaf raking in the fall and occasionally cut the grass for some of the people in our church. There were times when I earned as much as $5 for two or three hours of work. Aside from the payment, I did not really appreciate the work assignments but when I began my teaching career, I found that those kind of activities could be great times to clear my mind of other distractions. And often, I found a sense of peace and fulfillment from them. Today, I was told that the strawberry season is ending, but the sweetest strawberries always seem to be the last ones to ripen. This news was offset, of course, by the beginning of the peach crop. And for a couple of months, we will enjoy fresh peaches and begin looking forward to the blackberries and then the fall apples. Yesterday, I ate some of my garden's first green beans and look forward to a few more weeks of them. Sometimes, getting our hands dirty and working in the dirt proves to be a blessed activity and makes us thankful that God provided us a beautiful environment and made mankind the caretakers. Perhaps it's past time to show our appreciation by doing our part in adding to the beauty of this world. 
We need to join together in accepting the responsibility to preserve the earth and to live in harmony with nature and with our fellow men. Let's pray together. Dear God, guide us in honoring you by being stewards of the earth. Help us to appreciate our working together to serve you.